When you try your best but you don't succeed When you get what you want but not what you need When you feel so tired but you can't sleep Stuck in And the tears come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace When you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be will guide you home and ignite your bones and I will try to fix you and high up above or down To love to let it go, but if you never try, you'll never know just what you All right, let's get this kicked off. It's okay to be gay. We are different in many ways. Doesn't matter if you're a boy, girl, or somewhere in between. We all are part of one big family. You are enough. 
accurate queer kid stuff. <laughs> Opening a performance with lyrics like "It's okay to be gay for a room full of adults" is one thing, but it's entirely different for a room full of kindergartners. What you just heard is the theme song for my web series, Queer Kid Stuff, where I make LGBTQ plus and social justice videos for all ages. And when I say all ages, I mean literal babies to your great great grandma. Now I know what you're thinking. Whoa, they're talking about gay stuff with kids, but talking to kids about gay stuff is actually crucial. The American Academy of Pediatrics has found that children have a solid understanding of their gender identity by the age of four. This is when children are developing their sense of self. They're observing the world around them, absorbing that information, and internalizing it. Now, most parents want their children to become kind, empathetic, self-confident adults, and exposure to diversity is an important part of that social and emotional development. And Gender non-conforming kids and trans kids and kids with trans and non-binary and queer parents are everywhere. In the series, my stuffed bear co-host and I talk about the LGBT community, activism, gender and pronouns, consent, and body positivity. We tackle these topics through songs, not unlike the one you just heard, simple definitions, and metaphors. We approach these ideas to steal a phrase from an old professor of mine from under the doorknob, getting down to toddler height and looking up at the great big world through their tiny little eyes, taking these seemingly complex ideas and simplifying them, not dumbing them down, but homing in on the core concept. Gender is about how we feel and how we express ourselves. Sexuality is about love and gender and family, not about sex. And these are all ideas children can grasp. In one of my earliest episodes about gender, I used the idea of pronouns to underscore the definition and introduce gender-neutral pronouns like they and them. I encourage children to think about their own pronouns and to ask others for theirs. In later episodes, I build on this foundation and introduce big fancy words like non-binary and transgender. I get emails from viewers in their 20s who use my videos to explain non-binary gender to their grandparents. But I get one comment over and over again: "Let kids be kids." Well. That's a nice sentiment and all, but only if it actually includes all kids. Just a few weeks ago, a 15-year-old in Huntsville, Alabama, died by suicide after being bullied for being gay. In 2018, it was a seven-year-old in Denver, Colorado. There have been and will be many more. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual teens are more than three times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers, and transgender teens are almost six times more likely. According to one study, roughly one third of homeless youth identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning, and about four percent of homeless youth identify as transgender, compared with one percent of the general youth population surveyed. According to the Human Rights Campaign, there have been 128 killings of trans people in 87 cities across 32 states since 2013, and those are only the reported cases. And 80 percent of those killings were of trans women of color. The queer situation is bleak, to say the least. The YouTube comments on my videos are not much better. I'm used to the harassment. I get messages daily telling me I'm a pedophile and that I should kill myself in a number of increasingly creative ways. I once had to put the word "truck" on my block list because someone wanted me to get run over by a truck. Shower and oven are in there too for the less creative and more disturbing Holocaust reference. When neo-Nazis marched in Charlottesville. 
I was unsurprised to learn that the creator of a violent Reddit meme about one of my episodes was in the Tiki Torch crowd. This barrage of negativity is what we're up against. The crushing statistics, the violence, the mental health risks, the well-meaning but flawed response my parents gave me when I came out that they didn't want me to have a harder life. That's what we're up against. But in the face of all that, I choose joy. I choose rainbows and unicorns and glitter, and I sing that it's okay to be gay with my childhood stuffed teddy bear. I make queer media for kids because I wish I had this when I was their age. I make it so others don't have to struggle through what I did, not understanding my identity because I didn't have any exposure to who I could be. I teach and spread this message through joy and positivity instead of framing it around the hardships of queer life. I want kids to grow up and into themselves with pride for who they are and who they can be, no matter who they love or what they wear or what pronouns they use. And I want them to love others for their differences, not in spite of them. I think fostering this pride and empathy will make the world a kinder and more equal place, and combat the bigotry and hate that festers in our world. So, talk to a kid about gender. Talk to a kid about sexuality. Teach them about consent. Tell them it is okay for boys to wear dresses and for girls to speak up. Let's spread radical queer joy. Thank you.
My son was born in January 2020, shortly before the lockdown in Paris. He was never scared of people wearing masks because that's all he knows. My three-year-old daughter knows how to say gel hydroalcoolique. That's the French word for hydroalcoholic gel. She actually pronounces it better than I do. But no one wants to be wearing a mask or wash their hands with hand sanitizer every 20 seconds. So we're all desperately looking at R&D to find us a solution, a vaccine. It's interesting that in our minds, we keep thinking of the vaccine discovery like it's the holy grail. But there are a couple of shortcuts here that I'd like to unpack. I'm not a doctor, I'm just a consultant. My clients focus on healthcare, biopharma companies, providers, global health institutions, and they've educated me. We need to find the tools to fight COVID and we need to make them accessible to all. First, one single vaccine will not get us out of this. What we need is an arsenal of tools. We need vaccines, we need therapeutics, we need diagnostics to make sure that we can prevent, identify and treat COVID cases in a variety of populations. Second, it's not just about finding a tool. What do you think will happen when one of those clinical trials demonstrate that a tool is effective? Do you think we can all run to the pharmacy next door, we get the product, we take off our mask and we go back to French kissing? No. Finding an effective tool is just one step in this big fight because there is a difference between the existence of a product and access to that product. And now you're thinking, oh, she means other countries will have to wait. Well, no, that's not my point. Not only others may have to wait, but any of us may have to. The humbling thing about COVID is that because of its speed and magnitude, it's exposing all of us to the same challenges and giving us a flavor of challenges we're not used to. Remember when China got into lockdown? Did you imagine that you would be in the same situation a few weeks after? I certainly didn't. Let's go to the theoretical moment when we have a vaccine. In this case, the next access challenge will be supply. The current estimate of the global community is that by the end of 2021, so that's over a year after the discovery of the vaccine, we would have enough doses to cover one to two billion of the eight billion of us on the planet. So who would have to wait? How do you think about access when supply is short? Scenario number one, we let the market forces play and those who can pay the highest price or be the fastest to negotiate deals will get access to the product first. It's not equitable at all, but it's a very likely scenario. Scenario number two, we could all agree based on public health rationale who gets the product first. Let's say we agree that healthcare workers would get it first and then the elderly and then the general population. Now, let me be a bit more provocative. Scenario number three. Countries who have demonstrated that they can manage the pandemic well would get access to the product first. It's a little bit extrapolated, but it's not complete science fiction. Years ago, when the supply of high-quality second-line tuberculosis drug was scarce, a special committee was established to determine which countries had health systems that were strong enough to ensure that the products would be distributed properly and that patients would follow their treatment plans properly. Those select countries got access first. Or scenario number four, we could decide on a random rule. For instance, that people get to be vaccinated on their birthday. Now, let me ask you this. How does it feel to think of a future where the vaccine exists, but you would still have to wear a mask and keep your kids home from school and you would not be able to go to work the way you want because you wouldn't have access to that product? Every day that pass would feel unacceptable, right? But guess what? There are many diseases for which we have treatments and even cures, and yet people keep being infected and die every year. Let's take tuberculosis. 10 million people infected every year, 1.5 million people dying, although we've had a cure for years. And that's just because we haven't completely figured out some of the key access issues. Equitable access is the right thing to do. But beyond this humanitarian argument that I hope we are more sensitive to now that we've experienced it in our flesh, there is a health and an economic argument to equitable access. The health argument is that as long as the virus is active somewhere, 
we are all at risk of reimported cases. The economic argument is that because of the interdependencies in our economies, no domestic economy can fully restart if others are not picking up as well. Think of the sectors that rely on global mobility, like aerospace or travel and tourism. Think of the supply chains that cut across the globe, like textile or automotive. Think of the share of the economic growth that's coming from emerging markets. The reality is that we need all countries to be able to crush the pandemic in sync. So not only is equitable access the right thing to do, it is also the smart thing to do. But how do we do that? Let's make sure we're on the same page in terms of what access means. It would actually mean that the product exists, that it's working sufficiently well, that it's been approved by the local authorities, that it is affordable, but also that there is evidence that it works in all the populations that need it, and that can include pregnant women or even depressed people or children, that it can be distributed in a variety of settings, like hospitals or rural clinics or hot climate or cold climate and that we can produce it at the right scale. It's a very long checklist, I know. And in a non-crisis situation, we would likely address these issues one after the other in a sequential way, which takes a lot of time. So what do we do? Access is far from being a new challenge. And in the case of COVID, I have to say we're seeing extraordinary collaboration of international organizations, civil society, industry, and others to accelerate access working things in parallel, speeding up regulatory processes, engineering supply mechanisms, securing procurement, mobilizing resources, etc. Yet, we are likely to face a situation where, for instance, the vaccine would need to be constantly stored at, let's say, minus LT Celsius degrees, or where the treatment would need to be administered by a highly specialized healthcare worker, or where the diagnostic would need to be analyzed by a sophisticated lab. So what more can we do? Pushing further the logic that the global health community has advocated for for years, there is one additional thing I can think of that might help. There is a concept in product development and manufacturing that's called design to cost. The basic idea is that the cost management conversation happened at the same time as the product being designed, as opposed to the product being designed first and then reworked to bring the cost down. It's a simple method that helps ensure that when cost has been identified as a priority criteria for a product, it's made a target from day one. Now, in the context of health and access, I think there is untapped potential in R&D to access, the same way that manufacturers design to cost. This would mean that instead of developing a product and then working to adapt it to ensure equitable access later, all of the items on the checklist I mentioned would be built into the R&D process from the beginning. And this would actually benefit us all. Let's take an example. If we develop a product with equitable access in mind, we might be able to optimize for scale-up faster. In my experience, drug developers often focus on finding a dose that works, and only after do they optimize the dosage or make adjustments. Now imagine that we're talking of a candidate product for which the active ingredient is a scarce resource. What if instead we focused on developing a treatment that uses the lowest possible amount of that active ingredient? It could help us produce more doses. Let's take another example. If we develop a product with equitable access in mind, we might be able to optimize for mass distribution faster. In high-income countries, we have strong health system capacity. We can almost distribute products the way we want. So we often take for granted that products can be stored in temperature controlled environment or requires a highly skilled healthcare worker for administration. Of course, temperature controlled environment and highly skilled healthcare workers are not available everywhere. If we were to approach R&D with the constraints of weaker health systems in mind, we might get creative and develop sooner, for instance, temperature agnostic products or products that can be taken as easily as a vitamin, or long-lasting formulations instead of repeat doses. If we were able to produce and develop such simplified tools, it would have the added benefits of putting less strains on hospitals and health systems for both high- and low-income countries. Given the speed of the virus and the magnitude of the consequences we're facing, 
I think we have to continue challenging ourselves to find the fastest way to make products to fight COVID and future pandemics accessible to all. In my perspective, unless the virus disappears, there is two ways the story ends. Either the scales tip one way, only some of us get access to the product and COVID remains a threat to all of us, or we balance the scale, we all get access to the right weapons and we all move on together. Innovative R&D can't beat COVID alone, but innovative management of R&D might help. Thank you. Baby squirrel use a sexy motherfucker. Give me your, give me your, give me your attention, baby. I gotta tell you a little something about yourself. You're one of our flawless, ooh, you a sexy lady. But you walk around here like you wanna be someone else. You're fine, so fine, fine, so fine Oh, wow. oh girl, I'm gonna show you when you're mine, oh, mine Mine, oh, mine Treasure, that is what you are Honey, you're my golden star You know you can make my wish come true latches onto the cockroach, arcs her body and inserts her stinger precisely into a cluster of nerves in the cockroach's thorax. The venom that surges out temporarily paralyzes the cockroach's front legs. She then stings its brain, where her venom blocks its fight-or-flight response. From here on out, the cockroach is essentially a zombie. The wasp snaps the cockroach's antennae in half, uses the broken pieces as straws to feed off its blood-like hemolymph, then leads it into a subterranean lair. She lays an egg on her victim and carefully seals the burrow, which becomes her offspring's nursery and the cockroach's crypt. Over the following weeks, her larva hatches bores into the cockroach, eats it alive, pupates in its carcass, and emerges as an iridescent adult. This gruesome tale is just one example of parasitoidism, an evolutionary strategy employed by most wasps. 
Parasitoids feed off other animals as they develop, usually killing their hosts in the process. In fact, these insects are about to meet their ends by way of wasps, each in a uniquely dreadful manner. This wasp targets the ladybug, planting an egg inside its body. When the larva hatches, it consumes the beetle's body fat. It eventually emerges, but the ladybug's duty isn't done. It's now semi-paralyzed, possibly due to a viral infection the wasp gave it. The larva spins a cocoon between its legs, and the still-alive but bewitched beetle stands guard. When a predatory lacewing larva approaches, the ladybug twitches, scaring it off. Many other creatures avoid the ladybug altogether because of its bright coloration, which advertises its toxicity. After a week, an adult wasp appears, leaving its hapless helper's corpse behind. Next is the tiny but fierce Crypt Keeper wasp, which targets gall wasp larvae like this one. The gall wasp larva is also parasitic, but in a more vegetarian sense. It's feasting on this oak tree, tucked away in a chamber on one of its branches. Soon it has company. The Crypt Keeper wasp adds her egg into the mix. The gall wasp develops and eventually begins chewing its way out, as it normally would. But it makes a smaller than usual hole and gets stuck. The Crypt Keeper larva eats through the gall wasp's corpse, pupates within it, then makes its debut, crawling out of the dead wasp's head. The final victim is this caterpillar. It would have become an owlet moth that fluttered in the cool night air. But a few weeks ago, while developing in its egg, this wasp injected an egg of her own. The caterpillar hatched and began growing. And in a process called polyembryony, the wasp's spawn divides repeatedly inside of it. But a second kind of wasp also lays her eggs on the caterpillar. The original brood senses this and further develops into two distinct castes. What was one egg becomes thousands of larvae. Some of them are reproductives, others are soldiers. The caterpillar is now both wasp buffet and battleground. As the reproductive larvae consume its insides, the soldiers kill the other parasitoids. The reproductive larvae morphs into adults and the soldiers die within the host. Needless to say, the result for the caterpillar is very bad. This was just a peek into the prolific province of parasitoid wasps. Some venture underwater to find their hosts. Others are hyperparasitoids, whose victims are other parasitoid wasps. Scientists are still pulling back the curtain on these creatures. They can be hard to collect and quite small. The world's tiniest known insect is a microscopic wasp that parasitizes bark lice eggs. Though much remains unknown, some researchers suspect that parasitoid wasps are among the most diverse animal groups, perhaps the most diverse. Wasps have been perfecting their brand of parasitism for some 247 million years, all to give their offspring the very best opportunities life has to offer. Will you hold the line? When every one of them is giving up and giving in, tell me, in this house of mine. Nothing ever comes without a consequence of cost, tell me, will the stars align? Will heaven step in, will it save us from our sin, will it? Cause this house of mine stands strong. That's the price you pay. Leave behind your heart.
long within the past knowing we are the youth Caught into the beast out of world without the peace Face a bit of the truth The truth That's the price you pay So what I want to try to do is tell a quick story about a 404 page and a lesson that was learned as a result of it. But to start, it probably helps to have an understanding of what a 404 page actually is. The 404 page is that. It's that broken experience on the web. It's effectively the default page when you ask a website for something and it can't find it. And it serves you the 404 page. It's inherently a feeling of being broken when you go through it. And I, I, I just want you to think a little bit about, remember for yourself, it's annoying, right, when you hit this thing, because it's the feeling of a broken relationship. And that's where it's actually also interesting to think about where does 404 come from? It's from a family of errors, actually, a whole set of relationship errors, which when I started digging into them, it, it, it looks almost like a checklist for a, a sex therapist or a couples counselor. You sort of get down there to the bottom and things get really dicey. Um, but for, for yes. Uh, uh, but these things are everywhere. They're on sites big, they're on sites small. This is a, a global experience. What a 404 page tells you is that you fell through the cracks. And that's not a good experience when you're used to experiences like this, right? You can get on your Connect and you can have unicorns dancing and things, you know, rainbows spraying out of your mobile phone. A 404 page is not what you're looking for. You get that and it's like a slap in the face. I, I was trying to think about how a 404 felt, and it would be like if you, if you went to Starbucks, and there's the guy behind the counter, and all, you're over there, and you, there's no skim milk, and you say, hey, could you, could you bring the skim milk? And they walk out from behind the counter, and they got no pants on, and you're like, oh, I didn't want to see that. That's, that's the 404 feeling. <laughs> I mean, I've heard about that. So. Um, <laughs> Where this comes into play and why this is important is I, I head up a technology incubator. We had eight startups sitting around there, and those startups are focused on what they are, not what they're not, until one day Athlepath, which is a website that focuses on services for extreme athletes, found this video. Yeah, just... No, he's, he's not okay. All right. They took, that, they took that video and they embedded it in their 404 page. And there was, it was like a light bulb went off for everybody in the place. Because finally, there was a page that actually felt like what it felt like to hit a 404. <laughs> so this turned into a contest. Daily Path that offers inspiration, put inspiration on their 404 page. 
Stayhound, which helps you find pet sitters through your social network, commiserated with your pet, right? They, each one of them found this. It turned into a 24-hour contest at 4.04 the next day. We gave out $404 in cash, and what they learned was that those little things done right actually matter, and that well-designed moments can build brands. So you take a look out in the real world, and you can, the fun thing is, you can actually hack these yourself. You can type in an URL and put in 404, and these will, these will pop. This is one that commiserates with you. This is one that blames you. This is one that I loved. It, 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 it said, this is an error page, but what if this error page was also an opportunity, right? So it was a moment in time where all of these startups had to sit and think and got really excited about what they could be because back to the whole relationship issue, what they figured out through this exercise was that a simple mistake can tell me what you're not or it can remind me of why I should love you. Thank you.
Waddling along the parched Australian earth, this female platypus is searching for fresh water. Over the past year, a severe drought turned rivers and streams to mere trickles. She barely survived and was unable to reproduce. Could the next year bring a change in luck? It's autumn, and fat raindrops finally come spilling from the sky. Within days, the platypus finds a river and begins to hunt. Her webbed feet propel her along, and her waterproof coat traps heat close to her body. Underwater, she senses her surroundings with her duck-like bill, which is fitted with about 40,000 electroreceptors. This allows her to detect the minuscule electrical signals coming from a glass shrimp's nerves and muscles. She makes it a quick meal. And once she clambers back on land to construct a burrow, she waddles in a lizard-like posture, her limbs moving horizontally to her spine. The platypus has many quirks. As a monotreme, she's part of the most ancient lineage of mammals alive today. Consequently, she has a curious mix of mammalian, avian, and reptilian features, which is reflected in her genome. For instance, mammals usually have one pair of chromosomes that determine sex, but the platypus has five, which more closely resemble a bird's. Let's hope she gets to put them to use. She regains her strength, and as winter turns to spring, it's time to mate. However, she can't raise her young here. The surrounding land has begun to be deforested, causing the riverbank to erode. Instead, she journeys upstream and settles in a clear, deep pool sheltered by a river redgum tree. Suddenly, a rustle flushes birds from the undergrowth and a fox appears. These predators have threatened platypuses ever since they were introduced to Australia by white settlers in 1855. The fox doesn't see her this time, but the platypus will need to stay alert. Two males also occupy this area, and soon enough, they begin competing for her affections. Each has spurs on its hind legs containing potent snake-like venom. One male fights the other off and courts the female over several weeks, swimming alongside her and occasionally biting her tail. Eventually, she reciprocates and they swim around in circles before doing the deed. The male platypus has a penis with eccentric features like two heads and spines that aid in fertilization. Over the following week, the female constructs an extensive burrow furnished with a cozy nest. She plugs up the tunnels leading in, making them appear as dead ends to potential predators. Then, much like a reptile or bird, she lays eggs from her cloaca, a single opening that's used for both reproduction and excretion. She incubates her eggs and, as the river redgum tree blooms, her offspring hatch. Like other mammals, she feeds them milk. But unlike other mammals, she has no nipples. Instead, her milk oozes from mammary glands onto her belly, where her babies slurp it up. This pooled milk invites bacteria, but the platypus also produces potent antibacterial proteins, ensuring her newborns are safe. She continues nursing them for four months, hunting, evading the fox, and repairing her burrow all the while. By the time her young are ready to make their debut, the summer is waning. One evening, after the female platypus returns from hunting, she finds that one nestling has already struck off on its own. A few days later, the other also leaves the burrow. Soon, her young are living completely independently, and eventually, they'll leave this part of the river to make homes of their own. We didn't care if people stared We'd make out in a crowd somewhere Somebody tell us to get a room It's hard to believe that was me and you Now we keep saying that we're okay But I don't want to settle for good, not great I miss the way that it felt back then I want to feel that way again
dropping me off We were kissing goodbye and we couldn't stop I felt bad cause you missed your flight But bad men we have one more night Do you remember how it used to be? We turned out the lights and we didn't just sleep Remind me, baby remind me Oh, so on fire, so in love That look in your eyes that I miss so much Remind In April 2020, I made what many perceive as a risky decision. I volunteered to be deliberately infected with COVID-19. This infection would be part of what is called a human challenge trial, where young, healthy people are given a vaccine and then deliberately exposed to the virus that causes COVID-19. These trials help researchers figure out more quickly if a vaccine is working. I think this research is crucial because today I'm going to speak to you for six minutes. In that time, roughly 1,250 people will be confirmed infected with COVID-19. 21 people will die. And then this pattern will repeat, hour after hour and day by day, until we're able to vaccinate most of the 8 billion people affected by this global crisis. Scientists have been working around the clock to make those vaccines a reality. But what should we do when the human cost of waiting for those vaccines is rising by the day? This is where human challenge trials come in. They're different from the traditional phase three vaccine trials taking place now, where people are given a vaccine or placebo and asked to go about their everyday lives. Here, researchers have to wait to see how many people in each group become infected. Until enough of them get sick, we don't have enough data to know whether a vaccine is working. Finding an effective vaccine with this method can take months or sometimes years, and it requires thousands of volunteers. A challenge trial works faster because researchers control exposure instead of waiting for people to get sick. So instead of a year, we could know in as little as a month whether a vaccine seems effective. Instead of thousands of volunteers, a challenge trial relies on just 50 to 100. Because we know for certain when people are exposed and develop disease, these trials also allow us to gather data about the early stages of infection and our immune response. This data is impossible to gather in any other way, especially for people who become infected but never show symptoms. This knowledge is important for designing policies that limit COVID-19 transmission. The time saved translates into precious months head start on manufacturing, getting us more working COVID-19 vaccines faster.
These trials are useful, even though recent phase three results sound encouraging. The arrival of the first vaccine is going to be a monumental breakthrough. It just isn't quite the fairy tale ending we're all hoping for. We're going to need multiple vaccines because we just don't have the infrastructure needed to immunize all 8 billion people on the planet with just one kind. Each type of vaccine requires its own special process and equipment to make, store, and deliver it. If we had multiple working COVID-19 vaccines, we could make use of all of our equipment at the same time. Some of the leading candidates need to be kept extremely cold before they are delivered to people. This can be really hard, especially in countries where there isn't reliable electricity or a secure method to store them. Scientists have been using human challenge trials for hundreds of years. They've sped up the development of vaccines against typhoid and cholera, and they've helped us better understand how immunity develops to things like the flu, malaria, and dengue. We've even used them for other types of coronavirus before. There's been a lot of debate about whether challenge trials are too risky. I happen to think that those risks are worth taking. A challenge trial would only recruit young and healthy participants. Think between the ages of 20 and 29. Fewer than 1% of people in that age group need to be taken to hospital after becoming infected with COVID-19. This would likely be even lower in a challenge trial because researchers check to make sure that participants have no pre-existing conditions. The risk of a young healthy person dying of COVID-19 is around five thousandths of a percent. That means for every 100,000 20 year olds who become infected with COVID-19, about five die. If I were to give birth in the United States, my risk of dying would be higher than that. Or you could choose to think about it this way. If my little sister needed a kidney, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment before I offered her mine. And if I can take on that risk to benefit a loved one, it makes sense to allow people to take on a similar risk, to speed up the development of a vaccine that would benefit not just their loved ones, but everyone around them as well. There's a lot we still don't know, especially about the long-term effects of COVID-19 infection. I volunteered despite that uncertainty, because like many of you, I feel frustrated knowing that hundreds of thousands of people are dying. And that's without mentioning the millions more who are struggling as measures to stop the spread take a toll on their physical, emotional, and mental well-being. It turns out I'm not alone in feeling this way. Since May, over 39,000 people from across the world have volunteered to participate in potential COVID-19 challenge trials through a nonprofit I helped found called One Day Sooner. We advocate for challenge trial participants and have been encouraging stakeholders to begin preparing for these trials. As early as May, when challenge trials were still being considered for their role in the fight against COVID-19, the World Health Organization cited One Day Sooner as an example of the kind of public engagement needed to run a challenge trial. In mid-October, the UK government formally announced their intention to conduct a challenge trial at the beginning of 2021. It is clear that the COVID-19 pandemic is a global crisis. It has inspired record-shattering innovation and it has highlighted the heroic acts of many frontline workers, but it has also taken a catastrophic toll. The arrival of each new vaccine brings us one step closer to rebuilding, but the true global solution lies in those vaccines being in the hands of people all over the world. Challenge trials could be a part of that solution. Thank you. Yes, I do, I believe. One day I will be where I was Right there, right next to you And it's hard, the days just seem so dark The moon and the stars are nothing without you Your touch, your skin, where do I begin? No words can explain the way I'm missing you Tonight, this emptiness, this hole that I'm inside these tears, they tell their own story Told me not to cry when you were gone But the feelings overwhelm me It's much too strong Can I lay by your side Next to you Take care of you 
Missing you, missing you like crazy. 